What's going on YouTube? I am one of the few very blessed individuals here on YouTube who have ownership of a Kawasaki H2. That bike came out basically 10 years ago at this point. That bike came out for the 2015 model year. Most bike companies are already rolling out their 2025 models. So basically that bike came out 10 years ago. It's a decade old. And something that seemed to make a lot of people angry on the internet is when I badmouthed the Kawasaki H2. It seems to me that there is a lot of mystique around this bike and people do not tolerate when you talk bad or talk about the secrets of this bike. And I think there is a small possibility that the owners of Kawasaki H2s don't like it when people talk about this bike in a weird way because it, they're afraid of devaluing their incredibly expensive sport bike. I am not one of these people. I actually have a history here on YouTube of being incredibly harsh when talking about my bikes, and that is mainly because I'm not paid by any of these companies to say nice things. And since most motorcycle reviewers out there are paid to say nice things, I usually go out of my way to be a little bit more harsh just so I can even out the playing field. Because if the entire online space is going to be positive, someone has to take care of the negatives. But that's not what we're here to do today. I'm not here to, I'm not here to dump on the H2 crap on people's dreams the entire time. I actually really want to be positive. I don't mean to crush people's dreams when I'm talking badly about the H2. It's just, I have my feelings about the bike. So here are five things that you may not know about the Kawasaki H2 from an owner's perspective. And so the first thing that you're going to know is that no Kawasaki H2 owner is going to tell you. Because a lot of them want to seem special. I think I'm K is the only one who's ever talked about this because he has an H2R and a regular H2. So he's going to know this more than anybody, but the Kawasaki H2 and the H2R are not the same bike. They are not even close to the same bike. A lot of people will buy base Kawasaki H2s and they'll put winglets on them that look exactly like the Kawasaki H2R, even though it is not. This is a base regular H2. A very easy way that you can tell a base model H2 apart from an H2R is that an H2 is going to have headlights, these lights, with a big headlight in the middle. This is going to be blocked off. And I believe that there's a hole here on the H2R. There's a hole on the other side for the H2. I think that there is an extra part for the radiator or maybe another intake. I believe that this is a hole on the H2R. There is a hole on the right side on the base model as an air intake. That's normal. There's a hole here on the H2R. On the regular H2, this is blocked off. So if you ever see someone at a car meet or a bike meet that has a little H2R emblem here, they have all the winglets, but you look and you notice that there's no hole and that's blocked off there. You know that person's a poser and doesn't actually have a real H2. H2R, H2R. It's a real H2, just not a real H2R. What's up? What year is that? The 24. Brand new. Yes, sir. <laughs> Thank you. Appreciate that. Yeah, speaking of the paint, not a lot of people know this. I think a lot of H2 fanboys are already going to know exactly what I'm going to be talking about. But this bike comes with self-healing paint. If you get a small scratch, like let's say you're cleaning the bike, you're detailing it with your with your you know waterless touch, watch, whatever, and you get some micro scratches on it, well, you would think how tragic on your $36,000 bike that you just put scratches all over it, but no. Kawasaki planned for this. If you leave this bike out in the sun, it has this weird film. It's like you could scratch it with your fingernail if you really tried. Like it's like a like a light plastic over the paint of the bike. It's like a light plastic over the film of the paint of the bike. If you leave it out in the sun, it will heal those micro scratches. I'm not even kidding. Rock chips, maybe not so much. It'll heal the rock chips to make it look like it'll blend into the paint better so you don't notice it as much, but still micro scratches get completely healed. Like, I've seen this tank have tons of scratches all over it before, and I leave it out in the sun, I come back in an hour, and it's totally fine. It is one of the coolest things about this bike, and I wish every single motorcycle had it, dude. Ducati, please put it on your bikes. I am begging you, please, Ducati. I give you so much of my money already. Please give me self-healing on a Pedigale. Come, oh my god, find neutral. I'm about to make that my third thing. No, I'm not. My third thing about the Kawasaki H2, this is going to be a negative thing. We had a neutral, we had a positive thing, and now we're going to have a negative thing. I gotta balance it out. This bike gets hot. And I don't mean like physically. Physically, it actually doesn't get that hot. It doesn't get much hotter than any other 1000cc motorcycle, luckily. Come on, dude, that was your first. Let me go. I've explained this in so many videos, but I apparently still feel the need to explain this even further. But this bike has two temperature gauges. It has a coolant temperature gauge and it has a boost temperature gauge. Both of these systems are separate. The boost temperature gauge sits on top of the supercharger, which is above the entire engine of the bike. It's sitting right under me. The coolant temperature gauge is the same as any other motorcycle. 
And the thing is about any 1000cc motorcycle is it doesn't like sitting in traffic. And so when it's sitting in traffic, it gets very hot. Sitting on the bike, it gets quite hot. But that's like sitting in traffic. That's what every 1000cc bike does. That's, that's completely forgivable. That's fine. The bike is just expelling of the heat naturally and it's blowing it onto your legs and it sucks, but it's not hurting the bike by any means. What does suck is when you're going super, super, I'm gonna not say a number, but super, super fast. What you would think that you would be doing on a Kawasaki H2. Like those 4 a.m., you know, ripping as hard as you can. You know, she broke up with me. She's texting another guy. Oh, I'm going 200 miles an hour. And the boost temperature gauge goes flying up. Like that, that number, you were looking at the twos in the triple digits, like the 200s, 230s, 240s. And I mean, that's only if you're like really pinning the bike. Like if you're really pushing this thing to its limit, then you're gonna see those numbers, but. Whee! This is fun. Oh yeah, ah, oh, this is just. I hate that I have to blow up everybody's ears because I still don't have a proper exhaust on this system. This bike yet, but it's fine. But yeah, yeah so the boost, the boost temperature gets a little out of hand, and there's not much you can do about that. <laughs> Woo! <laughs> yeah, this is not a bike you really want to ride one-handed too much. I'm not going to make this one of my things, but yeah, the, uh, the the throttle is very touchy, and I think that's only because it's still stock. It's not running a tune, and a tune would help that out immensely. But yeah, it's quite on or off, as you can tell. Not a great bike to wheelie. <laughs> oh my god. The one remedy for the bike getting too hot is there is a modification called an intercooler that you can add to this bike. Now a lot of H2 owners have told me, oh you don't need it, but here's the thing. If you're going to be running the bike as hard as someone who would buy an H2, like how much you would want to run it hard, those insane boost temperatures you're going to be causing long term damage to the bike. It doesn't matter which way you put it, but a bike having metal parts that are hitting 240 degrees Fahrenheit that's not good for the longevity of the, of the metals. Now you could cry about it, but that's that's just, it's just facts. These, these are factual statements. Yeah, you can probably get away with running your H2 without an intercooler, having those insane hot temperatures. I'm sure people have done it, but I don't feel safe with that because I plan on keeping this bike for a long time. I would like to keep this bike for as long as possible, and I would like it to run reliably. So if I do plan on ever doing that again with this bike, like taking out at those 4 a.m. rips, like super hard. I'm gonna wait till I get in a cooler. Look at me accelerating in a corner like a bad boy. An H2, ex what the fuck? I was like, really buddy? You're just gonna fly right through that? Not wait your turn? Great, now I have him behind me and I don't know if that's a good idea now. So it's not the end of the world. You just get an intercooler and then this bike runs perfectly. It just sucks that you have to do that on this bike. It's not a naturally aspirated bike and that sucks, but that's why you buy it, so deal with it. The next thing I'm gonna talk about that no one ever talks about on this bike is the electronic package. It is simultaneously the best and worst electronic package I have ever felt on a motorcycle in my life. Now, I've had some bikes with some pretty bad electronics. My Triumph Triple comes to mind. That bike has horrible electronics. I hated it. I just turned it off most of the time on that bike, which sucks because it's a 1200cc triple. You kind of would hope that the electronics would work, right? Because sometimes you just want to turn your brain off and ride a bike. You don't want to have to worry about all that. Now, this bike, if it was just a regular 1000cc bike, had this electronics package and had a little bit smoother of a throttle. These are, these are some pretty good electronics, man. I'm not going to lie. I usually have them set to one. I just set it and forget it, and that's I, I, I leave it alone. It's got great wheelie control. It lets you get the wheel up a little bit without looping. It's got fantastic ABS and brakes. It's got some pretty good traction control also. It just cuts the throttle exactly when you would want it to. And it's just, it runs it perfectly at one. The issue is that for how much this bike costs in the category that it's in, like I get this bike doesn't really have any competition. It's in its own class. I guess the Hayabusa, but like even that's such a different bike compared to this. But like take, take the, but like take the Panigale V4, take the BMW S1K. All these bikes have way, way better electronics than this bike. Fully customizable wheelie control, fully customizable trash control, everything's independent, you got a full menu system. This bike doesn't even have power modes, it has a rain mode and that's it. <laughs> it has rain mode and full power. And I can show you guys rain mode real quick if you're curious. I think this is how you turn it on. I'm going to show you guys rain mode on the Kawasaki H2 real quick. This is first gear by the way, full throttle. You guys ready for this? That was full throttle. If it was off, I would have already been at like 120. Let's see that one more time. You guys ready? This is rain mode on the Kawasaki H2. Yeah, super exciting, right? 
Actually, I'm gonna ride like this for a little bit. It's actually like really, it's so much easier to control on this smaller speed setting. It's so much nicer to ride actually when it's in rain mode. I'm not like constantly having to like twist the throttle to make sure the throttle's perfect. I should have had it like this in the beginning. But yeah, the electronics on this bike are great. They just lack customization. And if you want that customization, I mean, I don't, I guess you could cross shop to a cheaper kind of Galley V4. <laughs> but like, I, I don't think if most people are cross shopping this bike, like it's not that, that's not the deciding factor between a V4 and an H2. I guess maybe it is because a lot of like, I've seen like people ride H2s and V4s together and they kind of equate them. They're not even remotely, they shouldn't even be in the same class. Um, okay, don't fly off the road. And the last thing that you don't know about the Kawasaki H2, I didn't know this until literally I bought the bike. But this bike has a service interval that no other motorcycle has. And can you guess why? It's because of the supercharger. There is a turbine service on this bike. And from, according to the dealer I bought it from, it is $1,500 to have your turbine inspected or adjusted. That's insane. That is insane. Literally the same, if not more, cost more money to have your valves inspected on a motorcycle, which if you don't know, if you're still brand new to motorcycles, a lot of these higher end bikes require service intervals around 15 to 20,000 miles. And that requires like a full engine tear down, looks at the top end of the bike. I'm not gonna get in the whole, you can look up more technical videos about it if you're curious, but usually you have to pay a pretty large service around that 15 to 20,000 miles. This is at the break-in service, so at 600 miles, you have to pay $1,500. Uh, I didn't pay that because I have connections with people who used to be a Kawasaki certified mechanic or he's currently still certified and he did it for way cheaper. So that turbine service is at 600 miles, 15,000 miles, I think. I think it's every 15,000 miles after the first break-in service. Now, you didn't know that. Now, just imagine you didn't know that and you were getting yourself into an H2 and you didn't realize that you had to spend well, well over $1,500. An extra $1,500 on top of whatever you thought you were going to spend every 15,000 miles. That sucks. What is that, like 10 cents every mile or something like that? I don't really know. Point is, you're spending a lot more money than what you thought you were originally spending. And it's also way more complex on this bike because look at all that supercharger mess that you have to get through in order to get to the valves. And don't forget about the tires that this thing rows through, the gas, the in actually the insurance is quite cheap. Again, cost is not usually something that comes up when you're thinking about buying one of these bikes. But I just want to make a point to it just so that people understand what they're looking at before they actually get into it. And a lot of supercar guys are probably going to think like, wow, this is nothing. Like a lot of car guys are probably going to think like, wow, what are you even complaining about all these bikes are so cheap anyways but as a motorcycle aficionado or a motorcycle enthusiast whatever you want to call it this is stuff that i just think about because the most 99 percent of people who are who are into motorcycles are trying to get into it as cheap as possible because it already is an insanely expensive hobby and with accessibility in mind i'm gonna be talking about i'm talking about costs just in case which look if that cost doesn't scare you then great it means we can have more kawasaki h2 owners because kawasaki only makes as many of these as they get orders and that order window I think it may be gone forever at this point, but... No, I forgot to turn off rainbow. That sucks, whatever. Uh, I know this bike isn't a cruiser, but this is actually my most comfortable bike. How sad is that, actually? But I guess besides the MTO7, but even the 07 is kind of an awkward seating position because I don't fit on it because I'm a little tall. The 07 is more for someone who's like five foot three, just a little squash. They can just fit on it. This bike is more of my size and has a nice cushy seat, oddly enough. I like this bike. It just needs an exhaust. So yeah, guys, that has been five things that you may or may not have known about the Kawasaki H2. If you guys enjoyed the video, make sure you hit that like button. Hit subscribe, honestly. Ask me any questions that you guys have about this bike, because I'm all about sharing. It seems that Kawasaki may be discontinuing this bike towards the end of this year. The Ninja H2SX, which is like their touring version of this bike, has already been killed as of last year, and it seems like Kawasaki is not going to be carrying the H2 into 2025, mainly because in Europe, Euro 5 Plus is taking hold, I think, in 2025, which is why companies like Yamaha have updated their MT09, killed their R1, and also Ducati has updated their Panigale V4 for 2025 as well. So it doesn't make logical economic sense for Kawasaki to keep this bike around if they can't sell it in Europe, and it's not really, the money isn't there to update it to match Euro 5 Plus emission standards. So this bike may be coming to an end, and I'm very happy to have gotten one of the last ones. So if you guys want to see more videos with it, make sure to stick around. And with that being said, I hope I was entertaining, and I will see you guys in the next one. Bye-bye.